welcome to Eclecticist. Eclecticist is a podcast that is an investigation of everything from the perspective of two English brothers who consider ourselves to be relatively normal. We discuss one topic per show. We are Benjamin de Campos, a designer and believer, Jeffrey Campos, an engineer and a general devil's advocate. We decide on a topic of interest and then we spend a little bit of time researching it. We record the podcast and we publish the notes on our website at the end. That's eclecticist.co.uk. The chief benefit is fostering as much of an understanding about the world through the topics that we investigate and hopefully prompt further thought and discussion to all of our listeners. This week, we're speaking about new atheism. Since the religiously motivated terror attacks on America in 2001, subsequently known as 9-11, a wave of animosity towards structured religions in general, and Islamic nations in particular, has produced the meme, New Atheism, and the many volumes that undergird it. In this show, we discuss the derivation of the term, key players, effects on religious communities, and the potential trajectory of an inflammatory vocal attack on faith. Is there anything new about atheism? Well, what we're not going to talk about in this podcast is uh, the evidence for or against um, the the motion in any great detail. Uh, we're going to. Um, it, it might be apparent uh, what side each of us are on uh, during this talk, but um, we're not really going to flesh it out too much. Yeah, we're not going to chase all the evidence down the paths. <laughs> no. We don't need evidence. No, and uh, debating tricks and uh, my first contention and uh, all that kind of thing. The phrase refers to a resurgence uh, of interest around the place of religion in society and its negative influences on public thought, possibly originally coined by Gary Wolfe in an article published in Wired magazine in 2006 entitled The Church of the Non-Believers. And just a little um, soundbite from that, which is uh, probably a good example of... um, we're going to be talking about. The new atheist will not let us off the hook simply because we are not doctrinaire believers. They condemn not just belief in God, but respect for belief in God. Religion is not only wrong, it's evil. Now that the battle has been joined, there's no excuse for shirking. What I will say about that, just reading that just then, is I think that's quite a good example of um, the uh, often spoken shrill uh, and strident um, pigeon holding yeah pigeon pigeon pigeon, pigeon holding pigeon yeah and pigeon (laughs) holding um uh, done by the people uh, or the um sort of liberal intelligentsia who uh you know like to sort of um protect uh the culture of um religionistas um it's often leveled at them that they are shrill and i think by saying religion is not only really wrong; it's evil. Is um, pretty, uh, pretty, pretty, pretty. It's pretty strong. It's pushing you pretty incendiary as far over the other side of the fence as possible. And uh, other other buzzwords I've heard, uh, which set new atheism apart from traditional atheism, are things like activism. Uh, so you know, atheists who are actively proselytizing um, counter evidence to religious claims. Vocalism, you know, they're just in the in the limelight, or they have the limelight for a, a period of time, and they use that to condemn religions and uh, the religious belief itself. Uh, a condemning uh, religion and those who follow religions, um, and muscular atheism, I particularly like it's just uh, people who do have um, a, a public face. Uh, they are quite uh, deliberately. Uh, inflammatory, and I think Richard Dawkins is a perfect example. I think we should speak about the uh, the core players in New Atheism. Uh, there are four who are attributed to uh, the beginning of this uh, movement, and uh, we all know them well. I mean, they're, they're, they, we know them well for the last five years, I believe, but uh, I think they only really started to uh, appear on the scene after 2001. Um, well, 2004. Well, really? yes, but uh, two thousand and one. I mean, all of them say that they were they were motivated to be a little bit more vocal. No, but we only started after the nine eleven attacks. No, but we still only really started hearing about them uh, I, I, a, few, I, a few years later. And I think even by that point, when we'd hear someone like Sam Harris or Richard Dawkins or whatever, who we'll talk about in detail in a moment. Sorry, I didn't mean to uh, steal your thunder there. Um, 
it's it was hearing them speak was like uh well i thought like hearing some kind of subversive comedian or something just sort of saying things that um i just never heard been voiced before i'd never heard anyone sort of speak about god uh, in the way that these people speak about God. Well, not quite the same way. Well... But there was always, I mean, George Carlin. Mm, yeah, but he wasn't really, um, like, a household name, like these, um, like the Four Horsemen are. Would you like to rattle them off? <laughs> yeah, well, in no particular order, um, we have Sam Harris. He's a neuroscientist and philosopher. Um, I don't think he's, he's not a professional philosopher. But, uh, he what is the a, hell does that mean? A professional philosopher. Yeah. What, what some, is a philosopher? A philosopher is somebody who actually holds that title and is usually tenured at a university. So they're literally paid. Sam Harris has got a degree in philosophy from Stanford, and he makes money from what he does. That's true. Uh, Sam Harris, he's, uh, he's famous for writing a book. I think it was number one on the bestseller list in America, at least for a very long time. The End of Faith, Religion, Terror, and the Future of Reason. Um, it's a small book. Quite well condensed, very concise, very book? very well written. I thought it was fabulously. Which well one's written. a small book? The End of Faith. Not that small. Okay. No, the one after it was is the is the short book. Yeah, um, they got Letter to a Christian Nation. They got progressively shorter, especially uh, in his little pamphlets that he published on. End of Faith's about the same size as God Delusion. Is it? Yeah, it was. It's, I read it in two thousand. It's because it's so easy I, to read. I think that's. What you it read was. it three years before it came out. Two thousand and four. I thought you said two thousand and nine. Two thousand and four. I read it. Uh, it was very easy to read indeed, and uh, I read it, it very quickly because it, it's so interesting. It just reads itself. Well, no. Um, Richard Dawkins, of course, and he is a household name, and he was a household name before um, this mm. post-9-11 Not age. Quite. Well, I've been a fan of Richard Dawkins since I was a kid. I've read all of his stuff, mostly because he's a zoologist. Well, and household evolution, name in your house. Evolutionary biologist, and... Uh, topic that fascinates me i read all of his books i'm a really big fan of his science but was always aware of his i suppose back then it would be relatively muted diatribes against religion um but they were always there in all of his books and it's always been his position he's very consistent we should say what his uh, his official title is richard dawkins atheist no I think uh, it's Richard Dawkins, evolutionary biologist. He used to be responsible for the advancement of the public... Oh, the Charles Sonomi. Uh, yeah, Char Charles Sonomi, um, this uh, genius billionaire computer Park. programmer. From uh, Xerox Park. Yeah, funded his position for uh, at least 10 years. I think it was 1995 to 2008, I believe, at Oxford University. Um, uh, and he advanced the public understanding of science, making science more accessible. Uh, which he did a sterling job. I don't remember who replaced him. Uh, his book was The God Delusion, brought out in uh, 2006. And quite a big book. Mm. <laughs> again, I bought it. I bought the hardback, so I suppose it was a little bit thicker. But again, I thought it was fabulous. Really well written, very clear. A very impressive book. I'm, I'm keen to read it again, actually. I think I'll give it another read. I was, I was most impressed by it's it. It's worth reading the um, the revisions that have come out. He's addressed things um, that's happened He's addressed since. all the lies. Well, he's corrected a few things. But, for example, since the book came out, you had the Muslim cartoon uh, the controversy and all that kind of stuff, which he... He speaks very so he's uh, illustrated wonderfully it about. <laughs> yeah, he's illustrated it. Um, uh, the third of the Four Horsemen is Daniel Dennett. Now, he is a professional philosopher and a cognitive scientist. An amateur cognitive scientist. All, all round, uh, very intelligent chap. And again, another fellow who I've been a fan of since I was a kid. Uh, his book, Consciousness Explained, which was quite a while ago, maybe the very early 90s. Absolutely brilliant. His book um, on topic is Breaking the Spell, Religion as a Natural Phenomenon. That was released in 2006. And he takes a real naturalistic approach. And he's much more interested in explaining the reasons behind um, religion, its effects uh, on individuals and groups. Well, he's much more gentle. He is. He is, for sure. But, you know, there are, if you're religious, so there are certainly barbs uh, in his book. Yeah, but I, I'd say that he's definitely um, stands apart from the other three. Yes, he's not a he's not quite the attack goblin. He's but, less uh, entertaining. Christopher Hitchens is. He's the fourth of the four horsemen. Was. The late Christopher Hitchens, I should say. Um, he was uh, 
previously famous as a, a non-fiction writer of uh, ins- very political and intellectual pieces for magazines and journals. He was a journalist and an, an author of, of many books. His book on topic was God is Not Great, uh, God is Not Great The Case Against Religion, uh, released in 2007. And the American release was had a different subtitle. It was God is Not Great, How Religion Poisons Everything. Yeah. Um, I have no idea why. Well, as the publishers, uh, Hitchens himself said he didn't like the fact that the headline, the strident headline, was then softened. He like he wanted it to be called "God Is Not Great." He should also say that he has other books, um, or at least one other book, uh, in 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 the similar category. The Portable Atheist is that, was that him or is that Dawkins? No, Portable Atheist. Yeah. Yep, and it's just uh, it's a compendium. Of yeah, but atheistical works again, but it's a lot of his own stuff in there as well. Mm, mm. Um, so you know, these are these are very intelligent, very famous chaps who have chosen to write books effectively against religion. Mm. I mean, uh, Daniel Dennett, maybe there's an argument to say that he's just tr- trying to, to to garner a better understanding, but uh, all of them are fairly. They don't have very many good things to say about religion, really. Why are they doing no. this? I mean, what is the problem? What is the perceived problem? Well, um, religion spreads false claims to facts. I'm reading the show notes, by the way, chaps. Uh, corrodes relationships between populations, provides a framework for charlatans. <laughs> I'm not reading this next part. <laughs> and technological growth endorses discrimination and absolutism. Yeah, so basically there is... Um, what was the problem with that? Uh, I don't think that's... Um, I it, provi- it provides a framework for charlatans. It retards intellectual and technological growth. Do you know what? When you say it like that, it sounds all right. When you see it written on a page, it says <laughs> retards. And that's uh, a word I didn't want to say. That's an Americanism, not knowing where to put the emphasis on yeah, syllables. It's like adult and adult. Yeah. And capillaries instead of capillaries. No one says capillaries. Yes, Americans do. Anyway. Um, actually, before we go on to that, we should say... Um, so the, the four... Horsemen, as they're called. I think Hitchens actually coined that. Oh, did he? Um, yeah, I think it's pretty lame, actually. Um, but in their wake, um, there there is a lot of others as well. Um, and I have to say that it's thanks to the Four Horsemen that's actually um, opened my brain to a lot of other people in the field. I mean, not necessarily people who go on about um, religion, but people in you know people of science. Mm-hmm. Um, there, there is a lot in their wake. So I think this list could definitely be... This list is probably definitely long now. Yes, absolutely. I mean, everybody's jumping on the bandwagon. So, the perceived problem, which I've just read. Yeah, I think, I mean, I agree that religion spreads false claims to facts because it simply must, relatively speaking. You know, there are lots of different religions that are peddling different truths, and obviously not all of them can be correct. So this is a, a, an obvious fact. Well, that's right. Um, but I think the problem um, uh, that the New Atheist saw was people um, believing things without any evidence, and those beliefs aren't personal beliefs. Those beliefs affect people who don't share those beliefs. I think that was their main bugbear. Um, particularly Sam Harris, who uh, would talk about um, people who don't believe uh, any of we don't believe in paradise, um, you know, don't believe doctrines of jihad and all this type this type of thing. Mm-hmm. And you know, there are lots of people caught in that crossfire. Absolutely. Richard Dawkins was probably more. Um, well, actually, both of them are quite science based. Like Sam Harris had made a lot of noise about religion getting in the way of stem cell research. Who he, he, he sees, he still sees as like the most promising line of research. In our age. Uh, but Dawkins is far more red in the face angry. Increasingly so. I mean, I, I, it, it, wor- it worries me a little bit about him. I, I, he's certainly uh, rising to the challenge of being called a uh, strident and shrill anti theist. Well, this is my point. I think he, he's actually uh, creating more of a problem because he gets so red in the face and he creates. Uh, he, he, I guess he does create a backlash of people who um, really don't understand what he's saying. Or not they don't understand, but they just don't like that he's getting so angry. And they don't really sort of think about um, the implications of people with fervent religious beliefs and assume that he's just as bad as they are. 
Uh, he's just dogmatic, but in the other way, of course, he's not dogmatic. Right, it takes an awful lot of faith to be an atheist, as they say. And there are no atheists in foxholes. As they say. Um, both not necessarily correct. And atheists are going to burn in hell. Evidently. <laughs> and um, no, they're not. Well, that's that's the controversy. Because, I mean, well, I say no, they're not, as in, well, if you're an atheist, you're not going to do X, Y, and Z. As if they seem to think that if you're an atheist, you can somehow opt out of God's laws. Yes. Well, I mean, this is the problem. I mean, this is the core problem that the Four Horsemen and uh, everybody on that side of the fence uh, believe there to be. And I think new atheism differs from general atheism I think mostly because it is the zeitgeist of the time. We have all of this technology, access to information is so much easier now, and uh, it's very easy to ping a tweet uh, across the Twitterverse and uh, get your point of view out there, and uh, and then take on the comments and uh, build a, a huge canon of works around a particular idea or topic. And this extra weight... Um, is something that new atheists can use as a response to the general power and influence of religion. I think religion has always had a uh, has always had a huge influence on politics and has always had a special reserve area for its own freedom of speech. Well, this is the thing. It's almost been unquestionable. Um, the effect that it has on politics. Like, for example, I was watching um, a couple of YouTube videos. And there's a couple of quite well-known YouTube videos um, from uh, b b before New Atheism uh, really happened. And it's John Cleese uh, who had just come out with the ghastly film, uh, the religious one, the Monty Python film. The Life of Brian. Is that Yeah, The Life of Brian. Uh, and he's um, on a talk show and he's got two, I don't know, very high up, um, priests of some description. Bishops, I think. Yeah, I think, in, I, I, in I, full I, regalia. Well, one was, um, I think the, the the big cheese, the Archbishop of Canterbury. Right. Um, anyway, but they are just so. Um, uh, what's the word? Just so nasty. Just so. Uh, well, they, they feel offended. Uh, they're they're they're, they're, they're it, horrified. No, but it's not just being horrified. As if they stand back horrified, they're just um, they are. You know, they are your holiness, your godly, you know, whatever the, um, whatever the, affectation, the, the, yeah, exactly, your holiness. Yeah. So these people are, you know, on their highest of high horses. How dare John Cleese say these things? Who the hell does John Cleese think he is? And that's pretty much their attitude. Whereas now, of course, his defense was, but we're, we're not talking about Jesus. We're talking about Brian. Um, well, you should watch that video, but I but now I have seen it. But the difference now is is that religious comes to us in this smiley faced, ingratiating way because it has to because it's had to give so much. Yes, indeed. which is something that Christopher Hitchens has said on many occasions. No, absolutely, it will uh, it will adapt uh, to survive, and if that means risking becoming completely irrelevant, well, that's right. It's becoming it, it so wishy washy. It. So well, 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 and, hang on, certain faiths are becoming wishy washy, and certain locations. Yes. So, for instance, in this country, in the United Kingdom, religion is really quite seemingly widespread. I mean, certainly there are thousands of churches everywhere. Where? Everywhere. Churches in this country? There, there are tens of thousands of churches. Well, I, don't, I don't doubt that, but I think they're fast becoming not churches. Yeah, okay. There, there's certainly uh, quite a lot of them turning into uh, Manhattan-style loft apartment buildings. Um, brothels. Yeah. Uh, there has been cases, I mean, not brothels and things, but like, you know, pubs. Vi yeah, pubs, venues, yeah, there are, there are pubs. music venues. No, absolutely. And I'm all for that in that preserving the building, I think, is important. Mm. I mean, some of them are absolutely fabulously beautiful buildings. And unlike a country like France, uh, we don't point tax money at uh, the maintenance of these buildings mm. in this country. It's all donations, which is quite amazing, which would probably explain why a lot of them are crumbling away. Oh, quite surprising. We must pay for it in some way. No, not taxes. Well, we don't have tithing. And it's not, uh, well, not really, no. No, no it, it really is so donations. How does it work? Well, it's donations. I cannot be right. It is the truth. I'll, I'll, if we, I find any different, should, I'll put this in the show appeal. notes. No, we should appeal, perhaps. But, uh, you know, all of these buildings will have uh, champions and uh, benefactors who will take on the burdens of maintenance, and especially the larger, nicer churches. 
uh, much like schools. Do you know what? We should definitely look into that because, you know, like, for example, a Catholic church, you know, the Roman Catholics, they're now down to, I don't know how many billions they're down to yeah. now, but numbers are down, but surely. I think they're down to the last few thousand billions. <laughs> Yeah, actually, that's another good point. Well, we're not we're not going to get into the, um, the, the the details of that. But I was in uh, Italy recently, and uh, good lord, you should see the churches there. They are so ornate. The finery, the gold, it is amazing. I yeah. mean, I, I, it always it always. I mean, this is off topic, but uh, when uh, Pope John Paul II died, of course, the tradition for the death of a pope is that they die in poverty. So his body was lying in state inside a pine box, and the backdrop was this fabulous palace that he spent his you know term in, and it was just striking. You know, I, I'll, I'm quite happy to be impoverished after I'm dead, mm. but uh, while I'm alive, I'll live yeah. in this palace and wear all of these gold garments. Yeah, during the only life we have, I'll live in the most um, abject luxury uh, you could possibly imagine. I'll suffer along with all of those fabulous dinners. Yeah, yeah. Um, but don't this... worry, because uh, you're dead for eternity, and then you know I'll be now, back now, to the soil. This Just is like a, a message of Jesus. This is a clear issue for the atheist camp. I mean, you know, they see these gross injustices, and uh, it sticks. Uh, it inflames people, and if I, I, I can imagine the way the new atheists feel is that they they either were never conditioned, heavily conditioned with religion during their upbringing, or they were able to shake off those shackles. And when they view the power of religion and, and the, the contradictions and mystery of religion, uh, and especially its, its bureaucratic maintenance, it does seem like something that they feel passionate to help in overturning. I think they're on a mission. New atheism, I think, they are proselytizers. They think we're so deep into scientific and technological discovery and understanding of the world that really, we really need to be pushing this off the cliff now. Enough's enough. It's, it's still holding us back, and we can't live with it any longer. There's a better way to live your life, and, and this is their argument. So, depending on where you sit, you may see that as they're, they're, they're trying to force their ideology and their worldview on people um, just like uh, religious proselytizers do uh, they're evangelical i'm not sure if force, strongly so. force is the right word because they really are just using words they are just using words absolutely they're not going to uh, hold an, a physical inquisition they're not going to fly planes into your buildings no well in the name of atheism well you know i mean hitler and by Mao, <laughs> Stalin. Yeah. Uh, you know. yeah. Anyway, so um, each each of the four horsemen they have their own views, and we've discussed this a little bit. But I think um, looking at each member, uh, Richard Dawkins, he he always has a problem with uh, what he see what he sees as cruelty to children when mm. it comes to religion. He thinks growing up in a religious and perhaps an overly religious household um, that you know, dresses in the appropriate garb and observes the right holy days and uh, perhaps compromises education in some way, uh, it is tantamount to child abuse. Yeah, um, yeah, I'm not sure the way you dress that up, really, because you, 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 you made it sound like those are pretty benign practices. I, th I wouldn't imagine he got any problem with, um, you know, kind of maintaining a culture which is relatively harmless. But I think you could make a case that teaching children lies um, that may stunt their development in the world. Like, for example, teaching that the world is 6,000 years old, etc. Um, that sort of strays into the but, area of uh, but the, child But there's culture. a real blur between culture and religion. In, in his eyes, or by his lights, um, no, no, certainly no. I think... I think that's unfair. I, I think... Religion is culture, and, and certainly it depends on the, the religion and culture that you're talking about. Yes, well, indeed. If, exactly. it's, if it's Judaism, then it you could argue that it's all cultural. If it's Islam, you could argue that it's all religious. Well, I wouldn't think that Judaism is all cultural when you've got the mutilation of genitals. But the thing about um, Dawkins, which I need to flag up, was he has no problem with people who celebrate Christmas and sing carols and stuff like that. And when you said about garb, it made it sound like it was you're in that kind of arena. Well, Christmas has nothing to do with religion. 
Although you do kind of pray to get the right kind of presence. Ah, oh, that's right. Uh, another point uh, of attack uh, from the uh, Richard Dawkins contingent is counter evidence. Um, he works hard to bring about a lot of evidence against the possibility of the existence of God, which I certainly appreciate because he really, you know, he, he does the work. And he says, uh, you know, despite, I suppose, the logical fact that you cannot prove God does not exist, he certainly brings up a lot of reasons why believing in a God as classically defined um, is problematic in the face of the evidence and the facts and everything we know about the world. And uh, I really appreciate that. You know, he goes into great depth about uh, different aspects of evolution and uh, natural selection and how that just simply is not compatible with a belief in well, creationism and uh, biblical literalism. And uh, he's good at that. All of his science books um, and his God delusion and I his... I don't know. Uh, he, he sometimes... Uh, I don't know. I, I think he does sometimes... Um, uh, seems to, like he's saying that you are an idiot uh, if you believe in X, Y, and Z. Well, uh, when the... Um, when the evidence is all around us. And also another thing he says is when someone puts it to him that, um, you know, wh what's so important, you know, why do you want to ram atheism down our throat? You know, some typical sort of thing. He will say something like, it's because the truth is so enthralling. It's, you know, I want people to understand the truth. And when he says it like that, it does sound like um, sort of the same sort of noises that the other side are making. It's like because he finds it so enthralling, therefore everyone should find it so enthralling. And that is a key argument that he occasionally makes, which, which I think is flawed. Well, okay, okay, not flawed, but not it, it's 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 not the right way of packaging what the messages that he's putting across. Whereas Sam Harris, on the other hand, we should talk about his his approach. But Richard Dawkins, he will also say, you know, when when asked, don't you find your outlook and your beliefs oh, yeah. to be bleak. I mean, you know, what's the point? Well, he always says, so what, whenever you say that. <laughs> he will, because he's saying, look, the facts are the facts. Yeah. There is no point. Um, uh, they say things like, oh, yeah, but I mean, why do you even get up in the morning? I'm doing an impression of Fox News or something like that. Why do you even get up in the morning? Fair and balanced. Sorry? Fair and balanced. <laughs> yeah, fair and balanced. Uh, and I usually have an answer that, you know, we make our own point in life. But ultimately, no, there is no purpose. Just blind. It's pitiless. What, what's that phrase that he says? It's actually from, it's not from the God Delusion, it's from the book before the God Delusion. Uh, blind, pitiless space or something like that. Because all there is, you're looking very confused. No, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm simply Did trying you know to, the soundbite I'm saying? I think I might. Uh, uh, it's, it's Ken Ham says it quite a lot as well. Time. As, as in, is that what you want to believe? And he does an impression of Doc, doesn't do an impression of Dawkins, but he, he recounts Dawkins as all there is, is blind. Oh, I don't know. No, I know, well... We might have to cut this bit out. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on to Sam Harris. Um, one of the best things he's ever said on this topic, uh, in my opinion, is... Well, that's damning religion, praise. Religion is... Well, it's good, <laughs> it's good enough, or it isn't. Um, religion gives good people bad reasons to be good. I think that's brilliant. I think yeah. that's precisely how you could view religion. Mm. It does. Uh, he says, giving good people bad reasons to be good when there are good reasons on offer. Indeed. I think is how he... Uh, yes, he, yes. He, he, and he and there on. are. There are. And I think that's uh, quite canny. Well, I think he's, he's one to watch uh, in many ways because he is very rational and probably the most rational and extremely... Um, relaxed and measured in the way that he thwarts the barbs um but it's not like he is um like the 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 cold atheist of dawkins he's uh harris is very spiritual um he's you know he, he's in many ways a buddhist but buddhist without believing in all the dogma yeah, he's bringing out an, a book on this, I think, shortly, mm. and I'll be interested. I never really well already. You've kind of I, made I, up your I, mind by the sounds of no, that I, sneer. No, not at all. Yeah, I just what? yeah. Well, I'm going to explain why I'm making that noise. <laughs> I'm I've never really fully grasped what he believes in terms of spirituality. 
Right. It's an, a gray area that I'm not. I don't get him on on that topic. Another topic is uh, um, objective morality. Again, I'm, I don't know where he stands precisely on that, and I'd like to see him flesh out his ideas in a book on that topic as well. But I'm looking forward to his book on sp spirituality. I mean, I think I understand that he he knows that you know, we, we run software inside of our physical bodies and we're interpreting the, the world, uh, which is true. And everything that you know or believe or see could all be radically different. And it's not really that realistic. It is for us, relatively speaking, but the actual world is a lot different than we perceive it to be. And there are limitations, there are adaptations. It, you know, it's, it's really plastic. Um, and I think that's where he goes with spirituality. You know, you really can think change the way you think about the world not changing the facts of the world but change the way you perceive them mm. and i think that's how he thinks of spirituality which i think is not how most people would think of spirituality but again he'll flesh out his uh, point of view in his book i'm sure um well, there's the, a couple we, of quotes we should here. just say that the, 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 the i might have already said this but what he um what sam harris is he always brings that to the table um his his own spirituality just showing that you can be a spiritual person. You, know, you, you, you can get all the joy um, out of life, uh, or as much joy as anyone can, by using your brain. Yeah, I mean, again, I think we'll, we'll get on to this, but uh, I think we need... To, uh, yeah. The problem with definitions, uh, yes. I, it's a real sticking point for me. But uh, a couple of quotes from Sam Harris that, uh, that I quite like. Um, it is time that scientists and other public intellectuals observed that the contest between faith and reason is zero sum. It, it just is. It just, it, you know, if it, one's going to win out. Yeah. And uh, a win on one side is an absolute it's, detriment to the other side. It's mutually cancelling. It is. And, it, it, and it's, it's difficult to be, con you, well, you cannot be uh, conciliatory or you cannot be... Um, you can't give anything away without harming your opposition. I mean, it's difficult to shake hands and walk away from the table both feeling good that you've come to some sort of agreement at the end because that just simply cannot happen. Uh, he recognizes this, and I think it's something that motivates people to believe he's an anti-theist, a hardliner, and unfair and unreasonable. And I think all of that's false. Yeah, I think that's a hell of a charge to make. Unfair and unreasonable. He's, he's exactly those things. Yeah, unfair and unreasonable. And, and I think if, if anyone were to make, to make the case that Sam Harris is anything but fair and reasonable, then they are just being intellectually dishonest, to use that canard. Um, another quote, the problem with faith is that it really is a conversation stopper. Faith is a declaration of immunity to the powers of conversation. It is a reason why you do not have to give reasons for what you believe. Uh, and of course, it can be. I mean, really, you can invoke uh, some liturgical terms in any conversation, and it will obfuscate um, yeah. meaning and, uh, and and stop a continuation of any, any productive... Uh, I'll just quote scripture at you. That sort of thing, but also a lot more abstract. I mean, uh, it's just... it's You cannot continue to talk about certain things. And again, uh, the trouble with definitions is something that we'll get onto. Um, Daniel Dennett... I'm a great fan of Daniel Dennett. I mean, I see him as a real scientist. You know, he really wants to know why people think the way they do, why we behave the way we do. He's a, a, a massive fan and student of um, evolution uh, quite by natural selection. That. Why you say he's a scientist? Yeah, but why read his books? Yeah, no, but you say he's you say he's a real scientist. Yeah, in the, in his approach, in that he sees a behavior. And he's, he's not thinking of the effects of that behavior. He's thinking about the, the causal reasons behind that behavior in society. So he'll think, how, how is that? How did it adapt? How did it survive? How did it supersede its limitations? So he's super analytical. He really right. wants to know how these phenomenons perpetuate themselves. Uh, and you know he really gets into the the the, mm. the nuts and cogs uh, of of the topic. I mean, uh, it's 
absolutely fascinating. And he draws, he's really good at drawing a lot of analogies to anything from machines to the animal kingdom and, uh, you know. But ultimately, he is a an evolutionist. He's a Darwinian, I suppose. He's also a compatibilist, uh, which softens them up next to um, Richard Dawkins a little bit. But I think his books are very easy to read and uh, very uh, accessible. I, I find them exactly not that. I find him hard to read uh, and unengaging. Um, and I think the, the I think the reason why we know about the others is because they are very charismatic. They're very articulate. Um, they're very good public speakers. Um, and I just don't find that with Daniel Dennett. I mean, I, I've tried to sort of engage with a few of his talks and things like that, but I, it just, I, I end up just drifting off. Um, I mean, he really wants to explain the naturalism of things. No, but I think, um, I mean, again... He sees everything as a machine and he's trying to explain how the machine works. Yeah, but he's had a couple of... Um, sort of run-ins, not run-ins as such, but a couple of disagreements. Or him and Sam Harris have sort of not seen eye to eye on a few things. And I find that when Sam Harris makes noises like that, I tend to think, well, maybe it's because I'm, I'm a believer of Sam, I'm a follower of Harris, is that if Sam Harris thinks that there's a bit of a disconnect and uh, that type of thing, then I have to take Harris's word for it. Mm. Um, yeah. Uh, Christopher Hitchens... Um, he's, he's very, uh, controversial. I mean, you know, people are, well, he is, quite, he's polarizing. He's in central, well, he's a polemicist. I mean, he's not a great man of scientist, uh, a science rather, uh, like the others are. So he doesn't, he's a friend of science. Yeah. He, he's a friend of science, but I think there's far more hyperbole, um, and drama and purple prose and purple prose. Yeah, indeed. In, 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 um, in his, uh, in his work on this subject. Um, but I mean, again, he's in a completely different camp, uh, I think, to the other guys. Well, he can, he he calls himself an anti-theist. Yeah, but I think he's maybe because he's not from a science background or something. But he just gets kind of petulant and um, kind of, I'm well, not stroppy, but he just doesn't seem to have, um, or he never seemed to have the kind of um, tolerance uh, as as the other chaps. I mean, even even Dawkins. Um, it's, it's like Christopher Hitchens, you'd have to sort of like, you know, watch out that you don't misstep. Otherwise he'd just, you know, he would just throw a strop, which I think is problematic because if you're debating, you know, I think it's important to think that maybe these people, they, their minds might be open to counter argument if, you know, the correct argument came along, but not Hitchens. I think he's a powerful personality I and mean, he's certainly entertaining. He's an excellent orator. And uh, evidently a brilliant raconteur. Yeah, I yeah. think his wife has released a book about his. I think she's going to be releasing a book every sort of year or something like that. Mm -hmm. Sorry to sound so cynical about that, but I just I heard her on a talk show recently talking about you know I'm always finding little bits of Hitchens' uh, <laughs> work all over the place. Oh, great! I enjoyed his book. I thought it was very good. Uh, I read of lots of his books, and uh, he's an excellent writer. You know, a, a real intellectual. Uh, he will be missed. It would be interesting to see where he would have gone. Had he moved. How are we going to see that? I said it would have been oh, interesting right. to have seen where he <laughs> I thought would have gone. you said it will, it will be interesting to see. No, no, not yet. Anyway, hopefully. Um, so those are the big personalities. And as you say, there are lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of people yeah, on both the, sides producing books. In their wake. I mean, some are definitely uh, good and some are... Um, not so good for the cause. Like, for example, there's this guy. Um, he's is a... Oh, what is he? Damn it. Particle physicist? No, he's an astron... No, I can't remember. Lawrence Krauss. What is he? A cosmologist, isn't he? He's something like that. But he is pretty much a caricature of the kid at school who would go, you know there's no Santa Claus. You know there's no Santa Claus. Yeah, you know, you know this this type of thing. Yeah. He is using his personal... Using his celebrity um, all over the world right now he's on the coattails of Dawkins um and he is even less engaging uh than actually should, oh, he, his latest book is everything from nothing or something yeah he tries to or make, something he tries to make the case that uh, he tries to define what nothing is right and Dawkins has written the afterword I um, think only because this is problematic because the religious apologists who lean heavily on bleeding edge science 
point at the Big Bang as being proof mm. that there is an uncaused cause, and that uncaused cause is God. So he, this is a, a just a, a counterweight right. that he's produced, mm. saying actually everything can come from nothing, and this is why. And I think uh, also the physicist. Which one? The one who wrote a brief, a brief history of time. Oh, uh, Hawkins. Yes. Uh, his book as well seems to suggest the same sort of thing. I don't, I've never, never read any of his stuff. In matter. Hard, hard going. I think right. he, he wrote an original publicly accessible popular science book. Right. And it was still really hard. Is it talking So he, about... had, he had to review, revise it and bring in another one, simplified version. Cause it's right. all just so hard. And, uh, and he's always saying, it's just hard. It's, it's, we're talking about things that are so far removed from our evolved ability to comprehend our surroundings that we cannot comprehend it and mm. really you know we have to defer to computers to work out all of the maths but there are occasional people who think they understand a little bit about it it's all very complicated he sells lots of books though so obviously there's some kind of yeah, because people audience. want to try no, no, and understand. As, as an audience of regular people yeah. uh that read his books i mean maybe they don't read them no but uh Moving on to uh, debates. Now, again, this uh, new atheism, I suppose it's a movement, uh, but it's, it certainly produces a lot of structured debates. Yeah. A lot, I, a lot of meetings between, you know, the two sides. And know, again, moving... Religious apologists and uh, atheists. Yes. And again, mo moving with the times you mentioned earlier about Twitter. Um, YouTube, I think, has just been such a huge part of this. It's been such a huge player. Because all of these debates eventually surface on YouTube. And in fact, Sam Harris, when he gives a talk, like the one with um, William Lane Craig, when William Lane, Craig, William Lane Craig accuses Sam Harris of calling... Witchcraft. No, of calling all his esteemed colleagues as uh, psychopaths. <laughs> and then Sam Harris said, uh, I didn't call them psychopaths. I'll leave it up to you to sort it out on YouTube. So, for example, I'm just really looking at the notes. We've got uh, Eugenie Scott talking about the, the Gish Gallop. Um, for those who don't know, the Gish Gallop is... Um, well, actually, uh, Dwayne Gish is a uh, elderly uh, young Earth creationist who brings a lot of very debunked uh, material to the table, but just reels them off at lightning speed. Um, and so you know, you're not able to sort of stamp out each fire because he's... Um, He's setting them so quickly. Uh, and that's known as the yeah, he, he machine guns falsities at you. Yeah, yeah. Again, in the hopes that you'll miss one bullet and then they'll say, aha. Yeah, and. and, and, and you, fa you failed to overturn this. Yeah, uh, and I, th I think it's fair to say that. Um, uh, what's his face? I just said his name. William Lane Craig. He, he does a sort of similar thing. Because he his debate trick. Um, is using the debate format, which is so rigid uh, that he's able to speak for 20 minutes and he talks about all of this stuff and then the other person talks and then he goes back and then he says, we have heard no... No, oh, but he sets out the terms. He said... Oh, he, yeah, he yeah. effectively says, you will only win this debate if you A, B, C, and D. Yeah. And then, you know, the, the, the challenges he, he brings out are, you know you can't possibly challenge. Therefore, he wins by his own definition. Now, I seem to... Now, okay, th th there's two parts to this. Um, one is, I think it's very dishonest to enter into debates and use those tricks. You know, I think... These are people that are... In theory, they're tr trying to teach you something or trying to get you to believe in what they're advocating. Um... But yet they're being dishonest. So how can you trust them? So I think there's a kind of uh, element of um, well, yeah, of I mean, intellectual they, dishonesty there. They want the, the whole point of having a debate is to learn. You know, you both want the, the the participants want to walk away from the table at the end having learned something. No, that's fine. But it's, it's like it's an analogy, perhaps could be capitalism, where you want to produce something. But you're in competition, and in order to produce it, you have to do so by compromising your integrity and cheating, or by hook or by crook, getting to the end and getting to the product. It's a competition. Mm. So, notionally, the debaters want to learn something, 
but actually they want to win the house and they'll do it by whatever trickery is available to them. That's fine, but I think it, that whole logic completely falls apart because I think when, um, William, unless you're firmly in William Lane Craig's camp, you will be listening to him and thinking, okay, well, I'm not buying any of this because you're using all these dishonest tricks. Well, you know, I cannot trust you. Um, and first, you know, we don't want to get into the actual meat of what he's talking about, but it's but he uses tricks, and I just think there's an element of trust uh, there, and I think it's you, that's someone I cannot trust. You know, Sam Harris, who's the other side of the debate. You know, he seems to be um, not using these tricks. He seems to be more honest. Um, he he benefits from the tricks. In what way? And he uses them against. <laughs> okay, against the, the other um, the the other thing, uh, which is why I think these debates are problematic, is particularly the um, the people on the religious side. Uh, particularly, if we're talking about creationists. It's my strong contention that they kn- they somehow somewhere in their brains they know that what they're talking about is nonsense. And they're smart people because they know how to, because they've already looked at all the evidence and they've figured out how to discount that evidence in a very dishonest way. It's like, for example, uh, Hovind. You know, Hovind has a... Kent Hovind. Kent Hovind, uh, the felon who's uh, currently uh, incarcerated. Tax fraud. Yeah, that's right. Um, Yeah, who would always say, I don't want my tax dollars speak uh, teaching... Uh, a religion called evolution in public schools. And it's like, well, you didn't actually uh, uh, spend any of your tax dollars in that, uh, Kent. Mm. Anyway. So he was right. Speaking of which, his son, Eric Hovind, I think it's Eric Hovind, he's got a, I was watching a TV show of his. And whereas Kent Hovind, I think, is quite shrewd, but a, a scumbag, a fraud, a liar, um, Eric Hovind, I think, is actually an idiot who actually believes this stuff. Um, it's worth watching him and people like him and the banana man, uh, what's his name? Comfort, Ray Comfort. Gosh. Uh, and all these guys, I think actually are idiots. Um, anyway, so I think, uh, the public debates are problematic. They're entertaining at times, but ultimately I think pointless. they're pointless. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I always struggle with the topics. I think, uh, the debate topics always frustrate me and I'm always frustrated in, uh, in debates, but again, I always, I, I, I try to listen to debates because occasionally there will be some really good points or uh, you know, a particularly good analogy made for a religious claim or a, a very interesting and original to me bit of evidence to support the other side. Or um, uh, an interesting religious uh, explanation or of a, a misinterpretation or something or other, which I find uh, very interesting. So, you know, I like debates. I don't so much like the structured topic. The structure, the rigid structure of a formal debate. I much prefer a discussion. Yeah, a chat. Uh, I don't see why there aren't many more of those. It always seems to be having to win the house, which mm, uh, scoring points. Yeah, which is boring. But uh, moving on to something, something that frustrates, str- something in debates that particularly frustrate me are the terms of use. That is to say, the jargon used in debates. So obviously in religion and most religions have their own liturgy and uh, they have lots of words that mean lots of different things well you know that is that, that's another trick that's the equivocation fallacy. it is it is uh, and i find uh, lots of these words incoherent and in debates it particularly frustrates me because both sides will sort of assume they know what is meant by a particular word or phrase and uh this just Boggles my mind. Well, no, they won't assume it's a trick. No, I mean the other side will agree that okay, we're going to be talking about this, right? As if we understand what that is, and I think already you're giving too much away if you agree to talk about something that really has a shaky definition mm. or is open to interpretation massively. Mm. And I think you're going to be going down the wrong path right from the very beginning. And as Sam, that quote from Sam Harris uh, got it right, it's uh, it's a conversation stopper. Mm. And uh, that's a real problem. I think definitions are a problem. Well, speaking... Of, well, exactly. The God, the God delusion. So I think that's accurate in that Dawkins is actually saying it's a delusion. This word, and its meaning that surrounds it is mm. a delusion. So that definition, it's understandable from the terms. Yes. But uh, something like uh, religion poisons everything. Um, it's not so... 
Maybe that's not a good example. But uh, well, I don't quite. I don't quite agree with the religion poisons everything thing. I mean, I've heard Hitchens himself talk about the question being put to him. I mean, everything. You mean it poisons chess? It poisons this? And then Hitchens explains what he means by that, and he said it a few times. And you know what? I never really caught exactly what he meant. But what I will say, just about because we're talking about definitions, um, I think what's we might have actually should have said this on the outset, was the definition of atheism and how Sam Harris in the, the book, his first book, he never mentioned atheism, you know, for, for good reason. Uh, and he says, um, by calling ourselves atheists, that already gives them so much ammo. It, it already paints a picture. Absolutely. Whereas atheism is a term that has no, no a word that has no, no content. Which exactly, exactly it's that. quite difficult to get your head around what he means, but then you think about it and it's like, oh yeah, of course it is. A bit like you, you know, in the name of atheism. Well, that makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. Well, I can understand how people think it might. Well, exactly, but it, but it doesn't. No, but when you think about it, it doesn't make any yeah. sense. It's it's yeah. ridiculous. Yeah. And so I th yeah, and so because of that, I think I think it really is just him that has the issue with the word. Oh, well, I certainly have an, an no, issue. No, no, but with as in of the um, four horsemen. Yeah, of the four horsemen, and just and just generally, I never hear them. Well, again, say, um, Hitchens called himself an anti-theist. Yeah, that's because he theist. wants to shout at you about yeah. um, indeed he religion. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, I can imagine most people, even if they don't believe in God, wouldn't call themselves an anti-theist. I have a, I have a strong conviction that most people really want it to be true because what want what to be true? The, well, the, what it's all about. My strong conviction is religion is pretty much all about this not being the only life we have and there is life after death. And I think people who don't even believe in God would like it to be true because they don't like the idea of dying. And I think that's really what religion is all about. Well, yes, I, I, I agree. Absolutely. You think, uh, you know, is this it, this veil of tears? But the new atheism, I think particularly, investigates and... Um, and, and and defines the logical problems therein. So, for instance, how would it work? I mean, actually, how would it work? The conversations that are happening now with new atheism are very functional. So an example would be, if you um, had a car accident, you, somebody, somebody who doesn't exist, has a car accident, and uh, their bodies are mangled, uh, but they live on, and they become embittered, and uh, they completely change and become really horrible people for 50 years. Right. And then they die. And say, you know, they didn't harm anybody, and they ticked all the boxes to get into heaven. And they get into heaven. Who are they in heaven? Are they that person in a wheelchair who's really bitter? Or do they magically become the person they were before the accident? And if that is the case, then the person who entered heaven is someone else. And who they who they actually were when they died has vanished into oblivion. This is this is a logical problem well, for a religious claim. Well, yes and no. I mean, uh, there's a guy. Um, what's his name? Rabbi. It's not Wolpe. I think his name's Wolpe. He, he's he's quite a funny man, a funny rabbi. He occasion he's done talks with um, Hitchens and uh, Harris. I think it's Wolpe. He said something quite interesting about that. He said, in the, before this life, before we were born, we couldn't possibly imagine what life would be like. And he sees that as the afterlife. We couldn't possibly know what it would be like. So it's pointless talking about, you know, will I have the same body? Will I have this? Will I have that? It's almost pointless believing in it as well. Well, but you, the uh, incentive to believe in it is this isn't it. This one life is, isn't... All. Which is shaky. Which is desperation. You're arguing against yourself if you argue against the logic. I mean, it's just... If you say God is unknowable and yet you seem to know a lot about him, well then, he can't be unknowable. I sense a debating trick coming. Well, <laughs> perhaps. It reminds me of a, jo a joke I heard this morning, which was... Um, if we are made in the image of God, why aren't we invisible? <laughs> That's a good, good one. But, uh, yeah, so definitions are a real problem. Is that in today's program? Um, perhaps, possibly. Right. Um, definitions are very difficult. And atheism as a definition, I mean, it's simply the rejection of a claim. So atheism is you claim something about God mm. you know, or a deity of some description and uh, to someone. Someone will listen to that claim and then they will say, well, I don't buy that. Yeah. 
And therefore, uh, they, therefore, by definition, they are an atheist towards that other individual's mm. claim. To say you're an atheist generally doesn't work because there could well be a definition out there of a god that you agree with, in which case you would no longer be an atheist. I don't get that. Well, because it's a blanket term. You can't just say... I mean, and this is, and the flaw is that the definition of God is open to interpretation. Yeah, but again, I, I think... You could say God is nature. I mean, I, I, I don't get the... There is. It could be one God that you could believe in, so you can't say I'm an atheist. Oh, I guess if you're talking about I can't, I cannot disprove. Oh no, that still doesn't make sense. Nope, I just don't understand what you're talking about. I'm saying that atheism is a contextual response to a claim. So it's right in here and now. If somebody makes a claim about God or a God or a deity of some description, however they define it. They, they're calling it a god. And they could say it's a non-human intelligence responsible for the creation of everything to you. And they say, that's what I call god. Your response could be, well, I don't buy that. And that makes you an atheist in that context with that one person. Somebody else down the road may have a different definition. You can't possibly know that until you hear what they say. So you cannot generally be an atheist. You can only be an atheist with respect to a particular event with another person's mm. claim. That's that's all. That's one of the reasons why I don't like the word atheist, because I think, you know, it's... Not only is it actively giving somebody the impression that you're classifying yourself as something, mm. which it isn't, it's unnecessary. Well, I just prefer saying secular. I think secular makes more sense. So I think, I think athe... Well, I think if someone calls himself an atheist, that means they might be boring about... Um, gods yeah. and belief in gods and lecture you if you turn around and say well actually I quite believe in them but if you say mm, shrug your shoulders say yeah. secular brought up secular whatever mm. but then again I guess most people probably wouldn't use the term secular um, but I think um, what? I think if so, somebody would ask you the question do you believe in God in your mind you're thinking well what do they mean what do you mean by God? You, you surely you cannot just know what they mean. You don't. You just don't know what they mean. Right. Especially if you don't know. I mean, you can have cues. You know, if you speak to somebody who's obviously a Christian, mm. they say, "Do you believe in God?" Well, then you know, if you know anything about Christianity, at the back of your mind, you may well be thinking, "Okay, he he's talking about Jesus, who is God and also the Son of God, and." the Holy Spirit, which is another part of God and the, the Trinity thing. And mm. uh, that's, you know, you'll have an idea from, you know, because if you're, especially if you're a cultural Christian, but you can't possibly know what anybody who comes up to you and says, do you believe in God? You simply are forced to be fair. You're forced to ask for an explanation. What, what do you mean by God? And the response on the other side could well be, you know, don't be facetious. Yeah. I think you would be facetious if someone said, do you believe in God? And you go, what do you mean by God? <laughs> it's true, but it's a, it's a necessary question. Right. Otherwise, it's a conversation stopper. I don't think... I, I, well, let's, I don't think we should get into this. But it's... Um, I think we'll just have to disagree about that. Yeah, because if you, somebody says, let's have a discussion about God, you'll talk around the subject, which you can do. You, know, mm. you can talk about all the various no, components. No, I'm, I'm not going to get drawn into this, because I think... I, I, I just think this is something um, in your mind. I, I think most people have... I, I think most people have the same idea of what someone would mean if they say, do you believe in God? Yeah, generally speaking. Yeah. Generally speaking, yeah. 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 Okay, so uh, we can agree is, on that. Yeah, but it's still a point of impasse, I think. Right. Generally speaking. Okay. Uh, moving on from impasse, we have another form of impasse, and that's <laughs> logical fallacy, of which there are... Hundreds, yes. hundreds of different types of logical fallacies, but just a couple of the ones that seem to come up a lot in in the books of New Atheism and uh, the well, post nine eleven. Or debates. just fallacies, I think. I think some of those aren't logical. Um, I think they are. Uh, straw man. That's a popular one. Isn't that so, just a fallacy? No, but they're a fallacy of logic. No, but as a, a straw man, you can describe what a straw yeah, man is. But a fallacy is. could be anything. There's a logic in its in a, a straw man. A fallacy could be. Um, a fairy. The logical, a logical is, is specifically talking about an abstract discussion. Right. Or, or a conflict of, of concepts. Uh, straw man is a popular one whereby you 
you consider somebody else or you put words in somebody else's mouth or you, you put them in a false position well, or you change the position that they have. It's my understanding that a, a straw man yeah. is where someone who's arguing against what you're saying, that person who's arguing against it, um, constructs your argument for you and then knocks yeah, it down. exactly. Yeah. Um, appeal to authority. That's, you know, well, he said, uh, she said, well, they said, or, you know, everybody thinks or something like that. So, you know, this is true because so many people believe it or because it's been in effect for this amount of time. Yeah, or appeal to numbers, yeah. Uh, no true Scotsman, that one's um, that one is used, that. used a lot. That's where you say, if somebody argues a point, you then respond by saying, well, no real intellectual would possibly hold that position to try and denigrate is that your called position. called No True Scotsman? Yeah. I've not heard no of that. No True Scotsman okay. would do this and this and this to their porridge. Mm. Um, ambiguity, that's not a logical fallacy, but it's super popular in that you're just ambiguous in your terms. And again, this mm. is the trouble with definitions. And well, the, I think you know, the, the, f- the, f- the fallacy of that, as we've already mentioned, that um, that's an equivocation. I find when, when people do things like that. We should also add to this list... Uh, Red herrings, non sequiturs, that happen a lot. People come out with all sorts of uh, completely unrelated yeah. things. Um, ad hominems, yeah. you hear them all the time, particularly creationists. It's like they'll often mention uh, Darwin was a racist. <laughs> they'll often say things like that. <laughs> uh, bandwagon, what's that? Well, people just getting on the bandwagon. Uh, we're all agreed on this is our argument and we're all going to stick with it because it's our argument. Mm. So you're strong, strength in numbers. There's another um, lo- logical fallacy, which is, uh, I've forgotten the name of this one, but I hear, again, I hear it all the time, um, where you set out, uh, I can't remember what they're called, but it's where you sort of set your terms and then you argue for those terms in a way Oh, you, you start with your... Why don't you help me out here? I can't remember what I'm saying. I'm, I'm trying to hear what you're saying. Oh you're you're talking about another uh, logical fallacy. Yeah. You didn't give me anything to... No, I'm going to edit that. <laughs> I am. Okay, moving on. Um, again, just general credibility of the claims of religion. I think a lot of claims, traditional claims from religion, as time moves on, and, and we're, we're in a time where technology is... is exploding you know it really is rapidly improving everywhere it's mm. inc- it's incredible everybody can see that wow you know what in five years we're gonna have this this and this and in 10 years i can imagine we're gonna have this this and this there's or, so there's so much competition another way to look at that is wow these um extremists they could really get their hands on uh, technology that really could blow us all up absolutely uh, which is another motivator for the new atheism movement i believe but the point is, is that we're living in a time, most of us are living in a time on the planet where we can, we can see the effects, the good effects that technology and science and technology is having on the human condition. You know, people are living longer, generally speaking, um, and there are always horrible areas of the world where, you know, things are moving backwards. But certainly in the West, things are moving forward at a, at a great rate. Lots of illnesses and, you know, any any maladies that affect uh, the human condition they're all being they're all being uh, uh, sorted out and uh, everybody's looking to science and technology and they're thinking wow so much good is coming from that area and yet we still have these these beliefs that are that are you know becoming increasingly less compatible mm. with our general outlook and uh, so the credibility of the claims is definitely uh, a problem for religion mm. and they have to compromise so the, the catholic church of course got rid of purgatory did they i think they did was it purgatory or yeah no it was purgatory. it was, it was uh, unbaptized babies not getting into purgatory hell. they got rid of okay, oh no 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 yeah, there was that as well maybe it's maybe it's both of them no because hitchens had a big rant about how, yeah, so they just how that was worse yeah than... so their ground the ground is shrinking beneath their feet mm. um which is a problem um Skipping to the media, I mean, do you think the media is feeling all of this? I mean, is, is it just down to the media? Well, um, I mean, uh, there is something to say about the media, which I guess ties in with what you're just saying about how we are uh, in, you know, te- te- technologically we're changing and improving this and the other. Because I think in many ways um, we're not. Because I think as we're getting more and more sophisticated, um, there's this tendency for very sophisticated minds to. Um, 
be desperate to show respect for cultures that are not quite as civilized as is is the ones that we enjoy. Mm. I think they tend to bend over backwards to accommodate um, cultures mm. that um, are you know very misogynistic, uh, very um, bigoted, yes. you could say, and things like that. And I think that's a bit of a risk. And again, maybe that comes around to the whole new atheism thing to begin with. I think Dawkins brings out that people who are extremely comfortable living in the West, you know, very liberal intelligentsia, um, standing up for horrible people. Because I think some cultures are better than others. I think there are very bad cultures that have a lot of defenders. Yeah, well, again, this is the whole morality argument. You think, you know, what makes one person or group able to criticize on moral terms a group or individual you know in, a, in another area with different belief systems yeah, but, think. but it's it's down to who has the biggest gun I well it is but I, where i thought you were going to go was who's to say it's wrong to... yeah the, the person who says it's wrong is the person who has the power to say it's wrong no i just don't you think can, so. you can you can disagree with something as much as you want but if you are unable to convince you, you know the other side that you're right well then, what is it worth? I think you can complain no. away, but if you can't change anything, it's irrelevant. No, I, I, I think any argument in that direction that suggests, well, who are you to say? I mean, I don't mean to sound like Sam Harris here, but I think he really hits the nail on on the head. I think it's a failure of compassion um, if you cannot see that certain cultures are worse than others. That seem, that sounds so generalizing, though. It just sounds dangerously take, broad brush. Take the Taliban is a civilization. Well, you couldn't use that word. It, it's a culture. Mm -hmm. I could say that you, you could make a good case that they're a culture that is um, not as good as our culture. Yeah, but not objectively. Relatively. Okay. Relative to your values, yes. You'd say, wow, no, they've completely got it wrong. Relative to your position. And even if everybody in the entire planet agreed... It's still a relative argument. I'm not I'm not giving them any any more credibility or any more weight in a moral argument. I'm just saying that it it is always a relative argument. That tweet from uh, Richard Dawkins Hang on, you here. You can't just say that and then cut me off. <laughs> I, I I think what you just said is it just demonstrates a certain mindset. It's a failure of compassion. I don't. You say that. I don't understand what you mean by that. What do you mean a failure of compassion? Um, exactly. You're, what what you're said. saying is you're judging say, for sake of argument, another culture as inferior. That's what you're saying. Absolutely. All I'm saying is that you can go ahead and do that. Right. But it's relative to your outlook and your values, of course. Hmm. There's, there's no objective, you are wrong. You're just wrong. You're wrong. There's Wrong from your point of view. You are wrong for these no, 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 reasons, no, no. and these are the reasons that I stick by from my relative standpoint. No. Um, well-being. The flourishing of well-being. Wrong with this respect is, this to well being. This is Sam, this Harris is Sam is Harris's. Trump. Yeah, but it's. I mean, again, just hearing you, I can imagine Sam Harris has that same frustration, which is why he wrote the moral landscape, which was flawed in my opinion. Right. And the reason why it was flawed is because he seems to lean towards objectivity, and I think this is problematic. He can go along and speak about well being and define well being as the ability to. Flourish in his words to grow to a, a certain age. Why do you age. say flourish like that? Well, that's his word. Yeah. He uses this again and again and again. That's why I said flourish. You think it's a better word? I'm, I'm not saying it's a bad word. I'm just saying that's <laughs> no, one the of fact, the words he used. The fact that he did it with scare quotes. Listeners. He did little bunny scare rabbit quotes. ears. No, because he does say this is how he defines it. He's, he defines it as him speaking. So you think it's just too vague? No, I'm not saying it's necessarily vague. I'm just saying that it is his point of view. And all of us can be agreed on it. You know, it's it's... Not a good idea to cut the arms off of children, right? It's not... For fun. Yeah, it's not helping their well-being, and it's not an attribute of a society that we can imagine would be a flourishing society as mm. far as human happiness is concerned, right. if, if we use that metric. But again, this is going to sound crazy, but to take an extreme view, mm -hmm. maybe beating children benefits all of us in mm. some crazy ridiculous way you just don't know it benefits us because some children maybe it scares off invading yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Be, uh, so there's a net gain. gain yeah um yeah you can make examples like that you could say 
the what was it, an earthquake tsunami in Japan yeah um, means that we're going to be so careful with uh, our um, nuclear power stations or whatever the hell um, that we're going to say it helps that... global nuclear security I just so think... we're, we're thankful yeah I, I think it brought it to our attention no, but it gets to a certain point where I think we do just talk past each other when we start pulling out examples like that when there what? are clear cut cases of uh, examples where there is um, uh, cultures, civilizations that are better than others yes Again, I can completely agree with that sort of judgment. My only point is that it is not objective. It is subjective. It is from our viewpoint. Right. That's all I'm saying. Okay. I can completely agree that when I look at a society that, you know, is hard, there, there is no even no attempt at equality between genders or active suppression. Hmm. Um, I look at a society like that and I think, well... I think that's probably going to change at some point. The, the morality I, I, of cavemen. I, I certainly wouldn't like to live in that society, but I say that because I come from a different society. Oh, so, they, so they would like to maybe, live in that Maybe society. if I was in that society... See, that sounds very uh, patronizing. How do you mean? Well, if you say, well, I wouldn't like to live in that society. Because, because coming from a different society, hmm. that's my point. But maybe women like to have uh, but, but if battery I was, acid thrown in their faces. But if I was in a society, if I grew up in that society, I would surely have a different viewpoint. A fader of compassion. Yeah, well, well, we'll stop there. Okay. Anyway, we should probably uh, draw things to a close. Um, I just want to end by saying that uh, the this explosion of um, new atheism in the world, uh, I think is ultimately a good thing because um, it's kind of um, taken some of the power away from um, religion. I say religion is in a completely broad term. I mentioned this before that I listened to um, Richard Dawkins on Desert Island Discs from 1995. And I hate that show. Yes. Yeah, well, I can see why. And uh, But it had Sue Lawley in those days. And um, she was just almost appalled. It was a very cold, uh, un a very un-Desert Island Disc kind of interview because um, he was Richard Dawkins was basically put into a corner and it's... The, the tone was, you need to explain why you don't believe in God. Um, and I think that's changed now. And I think that's because um, people are talking about this. I mean, I don't mean to sound like, what's his face, McGraw, um, by saying it's good that we're all talking about it, but it is a good thing. I think what might be a bad thing is the backlash. I think the backlash might cancel out some of the good work being done by these new atheists. Which I think is a concern, because we're so civilized. Um, it's kind of like we're so we're so civilized. It's kind of looping back on ourselves. <laughs> what do you think? Yeah, I agree. I think uh, it'll be interesting to see how things develop. Uh, the statistics seem to suggest that the world is becoming more, at least one set of statistics that I read, the the world is becoming more religious, really less religious, and that uh, the more religious areas of the world are growing at a much greater rate mm. than the Really? The non-religious areas of the world. Which areas? Well, I think um, it's uh, a lot of China is becoming religious. Right. Um, a lot Which sort flavor of religion? Under, underground religion. All, all sorts China. of religion. There's a lot of Islam in, in China. Is there? Yeah, a lot of uh, Christianity. Coptic Christians as well. I wouldn't uh, have associated uh, Africa's Islam population is with China it's for becoming, some reason. It's, it's becoming uh, more religious. Right. There's a lot... It would seem that there's a lot more religion with agenda there's a, a lot of like in islam you have a lot of madrasas that are mm. effectively brainwashing people mm. and radicalizing them yes. into uh militants and uh that uh if, if you're to believe the statistics is also on the rise so potentially we're living in a world that's becoming more religious and yet the access to information uh atheist information propaganda against religions is so much easier to come by mm. and again the the net benefits of technology are so much more evident now uh but it's it's you just don't know which way we're going it's peculiar i'd like to think that we're on a, a rise towards more democratic secularism uh better education uh, a greater standard of living for all um but you really can't tell who we are mm.
the fade out music for choice for this show is a uh, a very interesting high tech piece of music by an artist called Oni's Ashanti. It's called Sunday at Piedmont Park. It's beat jazz uh, and blip. And it's from his collection of music called Recursive Artifact 2 Nomadic Summer 2010 Edition. Now, this performer has built his own musical instruments. It's very much like a one-man band crossed with Iron Man. And he's able to play lots of synthetic music by positioning his body in a certain way by manipulating sort of keyboards built into his hands, uh, having lots of computerized feedback. Uh, he did a lot of 3D printing and uh, built the electronics and it's it's all wireless and it's amazing. You really should have a look at the video. It's uh, absolutely incredible. And the music itself is, you know, almost original. It's, it's really uh, very interesting. It's, I'd like to see music really start to you know, advance as fast as everything else. And I want to hear completely new concepts of music. I'm all for experimental music. Uh, I think you might enjoy this. Thank you for listening to The Eclecticist. Um, our website is eclecticist.co.uk where you'll find our show notes, our running notes. Uh, we'll um, add anything that we've discussed, uh, in fact, checking during the show. And also, if you'd like to leave some feedback, there is a contact form at the bottom. Great. See you next time. Bye.